Welcome back to Utility Sports, and I'm so excited. Today is the day. NBA free agency is upon us, the day that will go down in history for changing a ton of different NBA teams, some for the better, some for the long-term worse, and some in small, minute details that do end up playing a difference, especially when you get into the postseason. Does that eighth man really move the needle? Sometimes it really does. If you guys are new to Utility Sports, make sure to leave a like. Also subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on more of our NBA content. And if you're watching this video right now, the day it came out, I am live on the channel. If you want to come stop in right now, otherwise watch this video and then come hop in. Let me know you came from this video. I'd love to have you guys all watching live on the channel. I'm so excited for NBA free agency. I'll be live all day long. And this video is a little bit more prefacing for the actual event here throughout free agency. So. We're gonna look at all of the best free agents and then some of the other ones that I think are worth mentioning as well. As laid out by sportnot.com here, talking about the top NBA free agents. Number one, Bradley Beal, guard from the Washington Wizards, opted out of his player option. And now at this point, he is definitely in a position where you could see him probably stay there in Washington. That would be my honest guess if I had to assume what he's going to do. My guess would be he stays with the Washington Wizards, but you never know. If he takes some meetings, takes some phone calls, we could see a team get involved. Team to watch for here, Philadelphia. James Harden obviously opted out of that contract, gives them a little bit more flexibility to make move in free agency if they get off of Tobias Harris. If Beal goes anywhere, my guess would be Philly, but ultimately I think he's going to stay in Washington with the Wizards. We'll see though, free agency is always crazy. Maybe Beal is going to give us a huge shakeup. Number two, Zach Levine here. Sports not list him as the second best free agent available. Obviously they're giving a little bit of preference to age. So Levine a little bit younger than a guy like James Harden and some of the others on this list that you would maybe expect above Levine. And he's an intriguing player, very athletic. Obviously that is the telltale sign uh, of someone who, you know, we've been watching Levine throughout his career. The athleticism really pops, but the skill does as well. He's a really good three-level scorer, can really elevate his game when you need him to offensively. I like his pull-up three-point shot a lot. He's really improved a lot in his time in the NBA. I think back a lot about when he was a rookie for the Minnesota Timberwolves and just how much he's improved. I remember some of his 20 to 27-point games that he would drop with the Timberwolves what feels like so long ago, and those have become regular for him with the Chicago Bulls. He was a huge get for them in that deal. Remember a few free agencies ago, he actually signed with the Sacramento Kings. He signed an offer sheet with them. The Bulls decided to match, which was not the popular opinion at the time. And it's crazy how things play out because he was clearly worth that contract and is now in store with a, for a maximum. Again, I'm sorry, it's a little boring. I think he stays with the Chicago Bulls. Maybe he'll listen to some other teams, listen to some pitches. And when you do that, it's very possible that a team blows you away and you just you decide maybe I do want to play for that team. But ultimately, Levine goes back to Chicago if I had to guess. Then we have DeAndre Ayton, center from the Phoenix Suns, and he is a wild card. He's the player a lot of teams want, and he's the player the Suns are going to try and use to retool. If they can work out a sign and trade, which a lot of teams are going to have to do because of the cap space situation this offseason, Aiton becomes the player that could really shake a lot of things up. There's a bunch of teams interested right now. Could the Spurs, after trading DeJounte Murray, go out and make a move for DeAndre Aiton? I see it a little less likely. Maybe the Pacers, they've been linked. Detroit's been linked quite a bit. However, they've made some moves that has really deterred some of their cap space. Would they have to facilitate a sign and trade with Olenek going back to the Phoenix Suns? And that's a little cloudy already if Detroit would even want to do that. And then is Phoenix content with the Kelly Olenek being what they get in return for the guy they used to, you know, really value and took first overall in a draft above Luka Doncic. That's a big question here. Obviously, Aiden's going to really shift the market. I myself would not be willing to give him a max, but I think a bunch of teams maybe would consider it just to ensure they get him. If Charlotte hadn't landed Mark Williams on draft night, I think Aiden would have been in play there. A bunch of teams would like Aiden. Now, do they like him enough to give him a max? Will one team give him the max? I ultimately think that that's what decides his market and where he goes. The team that's most willing to pay is going to be the team that lands DeAndre Ayton. Which now we move into number four, and it's Miles Bridges, who got himself into a little bit of trouble uh, with a domestic violence charge uh, or domestic assault. I, I need to clear that up. No, um, I should have cleared that up. Excuse me. But 
by the time you come into the live stream, I'll have cleared that up for myself. But Miles Bridges, nonetheless, potentially costing himself some money with the news that broke the day I'm recording this, that you know he might not be able to go back and, and refix that decision uh, and rehash the situation, and, and it's gonna cost him some dollars. I, I think so. I think he was in line to maybe get a max. Now, I don't think that I would give him a max, but I could see a GM maybe pulling the trigger on that. Ultimately now though, I don't think there's any way he gets a max. Probably see him in line for four years, 80 to maybe five years, 100 if he stays with the Charlotte Hornets. A nice rich contract, somewhat comparable to what we saw Jared Allen sign last year with the Cleveland Cavaliers, which a lot of people at the time thought was an overpay. I did not, we saw why this past season. Number five, James Harden, a player a lot of people are really low on. I'm telling you, don't get so low on James Harden. He's rehabbing still from a hamstring injury. We saw that same injury. Chris Paul suffered it with the Houston Rockets the year that they were up three to two on the Golden State Warriors in the Western Conference Finals. He pulls his hamstring at the end of game six or at the end of game five, excuse me, as they were going up three two, and the rest is history. We know how he struggled the next year and then give him another year, went to Oklahoma City and thrived again. The year after that, brought Phoenix to the finals. Now, is James Harden gonna bring Philly to the finals? Probably not, but ultimately he's going to get better and better and better again the further he gets away from that hamstring injury, which by the way, he really tried to play through. There's a lot of hate and criticism around James Harden. I understand it, but you can't say this guy doesn't like basketball and you can't say this guy isn't tough. He goes out and plays through injuries and he loves the game. You can tell both of those things just by watching him throughout the regular season and throughout the postseason. He has had some gritty performances. Now he's also had his fair share of blunders, but when you are someone who's been in the league for 13 years at this point, uh, and a player who has been such a high usage player, you're bound to have some down moments. And I think there's still a lot of bright moments ahead of James Harden. Now, would I wanna give him a, a four year, $200 million deal? No, I wouldn't. But for the right price, the right amount of length, sign me up for three years, 100. Oh yeah, 100% sign me up for that. And I think that there is a few teams out there that would give it to him, but I think he stays in Philadelphia. Moving on to number six now, Jalen Brunson. And I called it, I said over three weeks ago on the channel that he would be a New York Nick. And I said that when they went to the uh, Jazz versus Mavericks game in the first round of the playoffs, that they were scouting Jalen Brunson while everyone else was saying it's for Donovan Mitchell. It's not for Donovan, it was for Jalen. They wanted Jalen Brunson to be their starting point guard and they're going to get him. I see it again, four years, $110 million. That's what's been reported. Probably what we see, maybe even a little bit north of that, maybe four years, 112, maybe up to even four years, 114, somewhere in that range. They're gonna do what it takes to get Brunson. I know the Mavs have a meeting scheduled with Jalen, but ultimately I think he takes his talent to New York City and plays in Madison Square Garden, the new place he calls home with his father on that coaching staff. Then we move to seven, Colin Sexton, another really intriguing player. And you usually have to say that about the restricted free agents because it means that they did not get a contract extension done with their own, own team. But Sexton's is even a little bit crazier because he got injured, team played super well without him. Does Cleveland value keeping him? Are they fine and content with him leaving? Do they wanna use him as a sign and trade piece? What do they have planned? I think that they're going to keep Colin Sexton. I think that's the goal. One place that I think does make some sense though, and you know, kind of got shook up a little bit here with the trade that we just saw yesterday uh, from the day you're seeing this now, they made a, the Washington Wizards made a trade for Monte Morris and Will Barton. I still think Colin Sexton would be the best guard out of those three. And if there's a sign and trade in the works, could you sell Cleveland on say a Denny Avdia or maybe a Corey Kispert plus a pick or something? To get a deal done there, does Cleveland still want to add another wing after drafting Ochai Baji? You know, I thought that made a lot of sense before the NBA draft. Now I think it's a little bit cloudier, but ultimately Colin Sexton could be a good fit for teams looking for guards. People don't really realize how efficient he was in his tenure in Cleveland up to this point. Now, obviously his season got cut short with an ACL injury. That's obviously a serious matter, but given modern science, I think Sexton will be just fine. And ultimately, I think that the Cavs are going to bank on that as well. They keep them around. It gives them some leverage with Karis LeVert as well in contract discussions. Anthony Simons, another restricted here, but this one's less complicated. The Portland Trailblazers are keeping him around. You don't have to think twice about this. He really emerged this past season. 
And for a team that's trying to compete, any grown player that has really shown signs of being ready to take the next step is going to be valuable for them. Yes, they drafted Shane Sharp. I love the upside. They're not going to panic, though. They take Anthony Simons and keep him in town here. They want to keep him on this roster. I know Blazers fans love this kid. I can't blame him. He's a fun talent to watch. I had the luxury of watching him in person this past year. And he was a lot of fun to watch, but he's also really honed his game. So a lot of credit to Anthony Simons. He's going to get rewarded nicely with a pretty good contract this offseason. Yusuf Nurkic, we're staying with the Portland theme here at number nine. And Nurkic, a good player who I don't think is everything that Portland needs in the front court. I really don't believe that. But he's good enough that with the idea of having Jeremy Grant and a healthy Damian Lillard and the hope that Shane Sharp can maybe impact the game in year one and Josh Hart, Nasir Little, Anthony Simon sticking around, you feel pretty good about your core that you don't need Yusuf Nurkic to be everything you need. You need him to be some of what you need. And that's a playmaker. I think he's really underrated in that regard. And offensively, he's just a, a pretty well-rounded center. Defensively, that's where you run into some of those limitations. That's the hope for Jeremy Grant here. That's the hope for Josh Hart, who's a really great rebounding wing, one of the best in the league at rebounding the basketball. And then the hope is that Nasir Little's athleticism continues to translate more and more. Hopefully, Little can stay healthy this year. And that's really been the big bugaboo for Portland over the last five, six years. Can they stay healthy? They've had a lot of issues. Think about when they had Zach Collins there, a player they really liked. Ultimately, they ended his tenure there because of some of those injuries. I think if Portland can stay healthy, they're going to be an intriguing team to watch this season. Yusuf Nurkic is going to be a part of that. He stays. Then going on to Marvin Bagley, a player who, who knew two years ago we'd be talking about him as a top 10 free agent in this class. Obviously, the free agent class is not as good as we've seen in some other classes. But there's still impact players here. Marvin Bagley's grown into that, especially with Detroit. They took a risk on him, but a very low risk. They barely gave up anything to get him. Uh, and Sacramento ultimately cut the cost, right? They wanted to move off of the guy they took second overall, one pick before Luka Doncic. Uh, and unfortunately, that's what Bagley's been known for up to this point of his career. But those final 20-some games with Detroit, we saw some flashes. We saw some serious growth and a pretty good fit between him and Cade Cunningham, which is really the biggest piece of information that you need to take away here about Bagley. If he fits with Cade, the Pistons front office is going to want to keep him. We saw enough of that. I think they keep him around probably a two or three year deal. I'm interested to see what he gets. So I think he's a, another wild card in terms of that actual salary because it's going to come down to what Troy Weaver values him at, which again, I don't really have insight to what Troy Weaver is currently thinking, but we'll see by tomorrow. John Wall, guard from the Houston Rockets. I don't think this one's very interesting. We pretty much know at this point after getting bought out that he's going to be a member of the Los Angeles Clippers because, well, it got reported that he's going to be. Paul George basically confirmed it on his Instagram. And Wall, playing with PG, playing with Kawhi, he's not going to be a super high-impact player, but any little bit they get from him is extra bonus that they weren't planning on having, and I think a pretty good move for the Clippers in general. Gary Harris, guard from the Orlando Magic, look for him to maybe get a mid-level exception. He might not get the full amount, maybe something like three years, 24 million. Uh, so only taking about 8 million of that 10.2. But I could also see him getting in that three years, 30 range. I wouldn't personally sign up for it, but I could see a team doing it. That's the tricky thing about free agency. Teams usually don't let their good players hit free agency if they really want to keep them. Some of these players are hitting free agency. It's kind of a sign that, you know, maybe some of these players aren't, what you think they're going to be or there's there's a few flaws in all of these players there is but gary harris is someone who could help be a bench spark plug i would think that's how i would utilize him if he was on my roster uh, and ultimately there's a role for everyone in this league especially a player talented like gary harris we'll see if that shooting ever comes back around like the beginning of his career in denver though tyus jones someone who i would personally ranked way above some of these other guys i would have ranked him above yusuf nurkic simply because I think the backup point guard spot in the NBA is one of the most crucial when it comes to winning. If you have any injury to a starting point guard, you need to have one of the better backups in the league to be able to sustain that. Tyus Jones, probably in the conversation, at least, of being the best backup point guard in the league. We saw how important he was this past year when John Morant was out. Memphis stayed afloat. Not only stayed afloat, they actually succeeded in large part because of Tyus Jones' contributions. He's another guard. I talked about Trey Jones yesterday in the live stream 
Tyus Jones, like his brother, very good when it comes to assist to turnover ratio. He's very smart and safe and secure with the basketball. He's a pesky, uh, pesky defender who can tip a bunch of passes and, and just is positionally spaced really well a lot of the time. And he's smart. And those are things that you can't really just easily find. Tyus Jones, he's going to get the mid-level exception. I'm not sure exactly which team yet, but there's a lot of teams interested. I would be as well for a backup point guard role. I think he'll be a really nice signing for whoever gets him. 14, Gary Payton II. I expect his contract to come in the range of three years, 17 to $18 million or so, which is a really nice payday for a grinder like Gary Payton II, who for Golden State played a, a really vital role. I hope for himself that he stays in Golden State, the team that really helped, you know, let him burst onto the scene. But a team that's really been rumored is my Dallas Mavericks, and I would not be mad about it at all. The Mavs really relied on Reggie Bullock and Dorian Finney-Smith this past year for all of their defensive responsibilities. And you just can't go into this next season relying on two players specifically for your whole team defense concept. I think Gary Payton II will really help them with guards, but also can help on the wings a bit, even though he's a little bit undersized to guard. You know, the Jason Tatums of the world, the Kevin Durant's. He does a good job because his arms are super freakish, freakishly long. And he's also just very inherently smart and has really quick hands. There are certain times there, you know, a player thinks he's got a, a one on O or a, he's blown by Gary Payton the second. And all of a sudden the ball's getting stripped from behind. Gary Payton the second, special defender. Offensive game has really come around. That was always the big bugaboo on him. That corner three point shooting is the biggest reason why. He fits on pretty much NBA on any NBA team based on what he's going to provide. I think the Mavericks would be really good, but ultimately if the Warriors keep him around, I think that's an A-plus move for them. And moving on to 15, a player I disagree with here, Victor Oladipo would not be in my top 15 ranking. Uh, simply looking at him, he's not the same player he was. Now, name alone, a lot of writers are going to include him. I understand why. First of all, they're trying to get people to read their article, and Victor Oladipo sells more than an Amir Coffee name. That's just the reality. Amir Coffee is a better player than Victor Oladipo right now. Uh, and I don't really think that's much of a debate. If you ask any GM, I think they'd probably agree with that. Most GMs would be willing to give Amir Coffee probably three times the money that they would give Victor Oladipo. But ultimately, Oladipo is still someone who can have an impact. We saw that a little bit toward the end of the season with Miami as he got some more playing time and had a little bit of an impact in the postseason. I think there's still a role in, for him in the league. We just need to stop acting like he's the same Indiana Victor that we saw four or five years ago because he's just simply not the injuries have caught up with him it's a bummer I loved watching this kid play in high in college and early in his NBA career but again the injuries just have caught up to him I think he gets a min, uh, veterans minimum uh, and it could be for any team I don't think it will be for the Miami Heat expect the Los Angeles Lakers to get into play Malik Monk as we talk about the LA Lakers there's rumors right now that he is going to potentially go to the Sacramento Kings and I see that they could use a backup guard coming off the bench and Malik Monk fits the bill for that. He's a scoring type who really showcased a lot this past year for the Lakers after the Hornets decided to not keep him around. Definitely was a tough free agency last year for Malik Monk. I do not expect the same. I think he's going to be someone who is highly impactful and someone who's going to probably net a mid-level exception somewhere. If it's Sacramento, good. If the Lakers decide to hold on to him, that's a good grab for them as well. I think that Malik Monk, a pretty solid pickup for whatever team gets him, as long as it's not more than the mid-level. Mitchell Robinson, another player I would have had higher on my own personal list. He's better than the 17th best free agent here. Uh, he just is. There are certain games where Mitchell Robinson looks like he's going to become one of the most dominant centers in the league. And then there's other games where you barely notice him on the floor, which is a little bit of a red flag, but it shouldn't stop him from getting a deal somewhat similar to what Robert Williams got with the Boston Celtics. I'm thinking three years, 42, maybe four years, 56. Somewhere in that $14 million a year range is going to be the perfect number for Mitchell Robinson. And I think if you're representing him, if you're Mitchell Robinson's agent, you literally bring a copy of Robert Williams' contract and you have an open dotted line and say, we'll sign. If you want us, Mitchell Robinson will play for $14 million a year and it'll be a really good get. I think he's a, a, a really good athlete. He's obviously got freakish length. We've seen him over the summer too, you know, handling the basketball, shooting three pointers. I don't think people understand how skilled NBA players are. Most of them can do that kind of stuff. It's always just fun though, enjoying and watching a seven footer doing it. Mitchell Robinson, I think schematically fits with a bunch of teams uh, and could be a really nice get for a bunch of rosters looking around. Now, if the Mavs 
do lose Brunson to the Knicks, my dream outcome for Dallas would be bringing back Mitchell Robinson. You put him with Christian Wood, and the Mavs go from having almost no athleticism to a whole bunch of it with Christian Wood, Mitchell Robinson together in that front court. Number 18, Mo Bamba. I think this is about proper ranking for him. Uh, I think a little bit of the fan base around the league, uh, NBA fans in general, are maybe a little higher on Mo Bamba than they should be. Perhaps it's because he has a pop song named after him, or perhaps it's because he steps out and hits the three ball, which is always exciting. There, there are some flaws in his game. I think he could get anywhere around that $10 million a year mark, maybe a little bit more depending on what the market kind of plays out as. The issue right now is this offseason, not a lot of teams have money. The Magic decide to not give the qualifying offer to Mo Bamba. Seems like they're not going to keep him around. So it's going to be an open market. A lot of teams are going to show interest and, and be potential suitors. Last year, I would have felt the same way about Laurie Markin, and he ended up playing a pretty nice role in Cleveland. Can Mo Bamba do the same somewhere? That's the hope, right? If a team signs him, they're going to look at what happened with Markin. And now I don't think Mo Bamba is going to be playing the three like Markin did in Cleveland. But the hope is a change of scenery. You unlock a little bit more of what Bamba was supposed to be when he was a top 10 pick in the NBA draft. 19, Thomas Bryant, a player who feels way older. He's only in the mid in his mid 20s, and he's a really solid big. Now, he's not as fun as Mo Bamba. He's not as good as Mitchell Robinson, but he's reliable when he's healthy, and he's really solid. And I think looking at a player like Thomas Bryant who doesn't do anything elite, but a bunch of stuff well, Nets you a market. Now, it's probably going to be a little bit cheaper. I, I think anywhere from 5 to $7 million a year is about proper value for Bryant. And that's going to be a valuable get for a team. You can look at him maybe getting a taxpayer mid-level, which is right around $6 million this year. If Bryant can slot into that for you, he can be an impact player. I think that there's definitely space for him in this league. But we'll see which team goes out and gets him. Ultimately, I do not think it will be Washington just with Gafford hanging around there. And then Patty Mills. I was kind of surprised to see him opt out of his player option. I know he's a solid player. I know he has a really good track record. Teams are going to be interested. But he just did not finish the season as well as you would have liked to see. He started the year really well. Uh, and toward the end of the year, kind of struggled uh, a lot. And we'll see if that impacts his market. My guess is it probably won't too drastically. Uh, but Patty Mills probably gets another two- or three-year deal, maybe with an opt-out in there. It'll be interesting to see where he goes. I wouldn't rule out Philly as a potential landing spot because uh, so I think that's a, a pretty good grab for them. Now, looking at some of the other free agents, I'm going to highlight guys I want to talk about. Uh, Ricky Rubio, he's going to go back to the Cleveland Cavaliers. That feels like a done deal to me. Goran Dragic, uh, it's funny to have him listed as a Houston Rocket here, obviously the Brooklyn Nets. He's going to be a Dallas Maverick. Jalen Brunson goes to New York. Dragic goes back to the Mavericks to play with his Good pal, Luka Doncic. Austin Rivers, I think, is a candidate to go to Philadelphia. Not only does his dad coach there, but we know how much success he had with the Rockets under Daryl Morey's own, uh, management. Austin Rivers next to James Harden. I think the band's getting back together there in Philadelphia. We'll talk about that again in just a minute here when we get to the power forward spot. Rajon Rondo, had he not had the incident with a gun, would have been an intriguing get on the minimum for me for a bunch of different teams looking to develop young point guards and, and really help them learn the game. But I think that mistake is going to end up costing him probably some money uh, and it's going to cause some issues to his market. Also, Aaron Holiday did not get the qualifying offer. I thought that was a little interesting, uh, but from the financial standpoint, it makes sense as to why. Dante DiVincenzo, another player who did not get the qualifying offer again I think that's pretty interesting he didn't from Sacramento's perspective I didn't think they really had a lot to lose giving it to him because uh, you could always withdraw you know withdraw it or rescind it later uh, but maybe they were scared he was going to take it and they didn't want to give him as much money as that qualifying offer was worth I understand that but ultimately DiVincenzo he's going to be out on the open market we'll see what team goes and gets him I think the teams like the Lakers uh, and any team that's really strapped for cash should probably go look at a guy like DiVincenzo because it might be one of their best opportunities to get a first round level player who's out in free agency. Lonnie Walker, I have no idea what the Spurs are doing. Uh, after trading DeJounte Murray, I don't really have a good read on them right now. Give me a couple weeks and I'll probably have a good understanding that looking at the long-term picture, uh, but I don't think Lonnie Walker is going to be in that long-term picture. So I think he goes somewhere else. We'll see where. 
maybe the DeJounte Murray trade opens up the door for Lonnie Walker to stick around. You know, that's the thing. I need to still have a little bit more time and, and read the situation. The rest of the shooting guards don't really matter. Wesley Matthews will be a good gift for a team. I think he stays with Milwaukee, though. Small forward now, Trevor Ariza. That experiment in L.A. was a disaster, like I thought. Jay Sean Tate, Rockets will keep him. Otto Porter Jr., we'll see what he gets. I think his contract's going to be pretty decisive of what the market's like. If he gets a mid-level exception, wow, uh, that's definitely interesting. Uh, and I think a little bit of an overpay. Yes, he was good for Golden State, but he's the type of player that would fit in Golden State. I don't know if he fits as well in other rosters, other teams, but we'll see. Kyle Anderson, someone who is definitely deserving of a full mid-level exception. He'll sign for three years, $31 million. I'd be shocked if he doesn't. Joe Ingles back to Utah seems like a done deal to me. Kevin Knox, not restricted. They did not give him the qualifying offer, as I would have guessed. Uh, and ultimately, he might be heading toward his last contract in the NBA. TJ Warren's one of the most interesting players in free agency. You look at a player like him who was lighting up the world in the bubble and has had a bunch of foot injuries and just has not been able to stay healthy. I'm interested to see where he goes. I like Cleveland as an option. Daniel House from Utah, really good get for a team that signs him to the minimum. Really good get. There's Amir Coffey, the player I wanted to talk about. Really solid player. Has immensely improved his game in the last two years. And I think that ultimately the Clippers keep him. He is going to be one of those players that really continues to take steps forward year in, year out, year in, year out. And I think he starts to play a, a serious legitimate role in that Clippers team within the near future. And that's saying a lot because that team is really deep. Power forward now, the player I want to talk about in here, P.J. Tucker from Miami. He's going to Philadelphia. I talked about Daryl Morey getting the band back together. He's got Harden. He's going to go get Austin Rivers. And he's going to go get P.J. Tucker. You know, this whole situation to me stinks a little bit like Tom Thibodeau when we had the Minnesota Timber Bulls where he brought in Taj Gibson, Derrick Rose, Lou Aldang got even in there. You know, we're kind of heading toward the same situation. We're going to have Rivers, Tucker, Harden. Who knows? Maybe some more guys can come along. If Russ somehow gets bought out or something, maybe we'll see Russell Westbrook in Philly. Just kidding. That's a joke. We will not be seeing that. And then Carmelo Anthony. Uh, one thing I want to talk about him. Every time I, I watch him play defense right now, I think of the I'm in danger meme. Uh, so that's just kind of my note on that. And defensively, he's not what he used to be uh, by any stretch. So Chris Boucher. Love him as a mid-level exception player for a lot of guys. Uh, for a lot of teams, he offers a lot of length and size and shot blocking on all three levels, which is really rare. I think a really good grab. Blake Griffin, Clippers are rumored to be interested. I don't think that they should be at all, but it'd be a feel-good story, him returning to LA. We'll see. It's funny how uh, after he spurred their owner there from a handshake after trading him, Ballmer's probably getting the last laugh as his team's really good and Blake Griffin's prime is beyond him. And then the center spot, Kevon Looney stays with Golden State. JaVale McGee, I think one of the better free agent centers available. Isaiah Hartenstein, rumors that the Orlando Magic are interested. It makes sense with Mo Bamba heading toward free agency. They drafted Boncaro, I think a switchable big who can play inside and out. Does help them quite a bit. He's got really good hands as well. I think he's going to actually help open up the floor a little bit for Paulo Boncaro more than people are expecting. Hartenstein, I've been highlighting him for a while now as an intriguing free agent this offseason, simply based on how he played for the Clippers this last year. He actually, based on advanced analytics for players who qualified, he was the best rim protector in the league in terms of field goal percentage against within five feet of the rim. That is a very elite status to hold. You know, you beat out guys like Gobert and Bam Adebayo. That's impressive. Now, is that going to be consistent? Probably not. But it's a feel-good story. Isaiah Hardenstein goes from bouncing around to maybe catching on somewhere in Orlando. I'm cheering for him. Then Nick, Nicholas Claxton. Uh, you know, for Claxton, struggled in the postseason, had a game where he missed 10 straight free throws. It, the talent is there. The stamina is not. And there's a lot of boneheaded moments, and there's a lot of mistakes, and free throw shooting is an issue. But I think if a team gets him, they can be a little patient with him. You know, Brooklyn's in a high leverage situation right now where they're trying to win. Nick Claxton is just not ready for that, but I think there's a lot in there. I think there's a lot in the tank that you can pull out, and I'm excited to see what happens with Nick Claxton. Just a reminder here, we are going to be live on the channel. Please come stop in, say what's up, say hello. 
and enjoy some of the NBA live stream today. Super excited for NBA free agency. I hope you guys are as well. And until next time, we'll catch you in the very next utility sports video.